In our first lecture, we talked about what induction is. And what induction is, is it's a way to use the past. It's how we use the past to predict the future. In the second lecture, I talked a little bit about the philosophy and the philosophical issues surrounding induction uh, and suggested that there's a problem with induction and the way to resolve that problem is to make the assumption that we rely on our concepts and categories to make predictions. So in this lecture, I want to talk about the nature of categorical induction. So I finished off uh, the previous lecture with a description of uh, what a category is. Uh, so I suggested that a category or concept is a behavioral equivalence class. And I've used this definition before. It's a good one. Uh, it suggests that what a category is is a group of things that are different, but we behave towards them in the same way. And to some degree, that's what an inductive inference is. It's making a prediction about something because it's in a category. So let's talk about the nature of categorical induction. So how does categorical induction work? So this is really a study of how people arrive at a statement of confidence that a conclusion category has a predicate, or feature, after being told that one or more premise categories also have the feature. I've highlighted in bold terms that I'd like you to be responsible for. Conclusions are things that are drawn from observations. Predicates are these features or these properties that objects have. And premises are lists of statements, so whether or not uh, individuals or objects have predicates. So the two statements that I've shown below, the first one is a premise, and the second one is a conclusion. So the premise is uh, children's brains use GABA as a neurotransmitter. The predicate here is GABA, and children's brains are the uh, concept uh, that we're talking about. So the brains of children use a chemical known as GABA as a neurotransmitter. Basic statement, right? So if you assume this is true, how likely is it that the second statement, the conclusion, is also true? Therefore, adults' brains use GABA as a neurotransmitter. Most of us are going to assume that children's brains and adult brains, although being different because they develop, uh, are chemically the same. They're in the same category. So we're probably confident that if something is true of brains in childhood, that it's also going to be true about brains in adulthood. And that's an example of a categorical induction. But I want to make some other points about this particular uh, example. A lot of these examples are going to depend on something known as a blank predicate. In the previous example, the blank predicate was the statement, GABA as a neurotransmitter. The reason this is blank is that unless you study uh, neuroendocrinology, uh, or unless you're a uh, neuroscientist, uh, you probably don't know for sure whether or not children's brains and adults' brains use GABA as a neurotransmitter. Maybe it's plausible, uh, but you're not sure. You don't have a direct experience. You don't have direct factual memory. You don't have semantic memory for this fact. This is crucial because if you don't have the semantic memory for it, in other words, if you don't know the answer already, like a trivia question, you have to use something about your knowledge of the category to solve the problem. We need to use these blank predicates to understand whether or not people make inferences from their categories. If you already know the answer, so if the conclusion statement is based on a fact that you already have information for, based on something you can just retrieve, uh, then you're not doing a categorical induction. You're not doing an induction at all. You're not making a prediction. You're just retrieving a fact from memory. And that's a different cognitive process. So in categorical induction research, you often see statements that are like this. Uh, you're being asked, uh, you're being given a fact about some category member, and you're being given a predicate that is plausible, but you may not know the exact answer for. So once you're given one statement, you assume that statement is true, and then you're asked to make some conclusions based on the relationship of the categories to the other categories and not based on some piece of trivia that you can recall. So that's why it's crucial. So this idea, categorical induction, gives rise to some, uh, some very clear predictions. So the first one we're going to call similarity-based induction, and this suggests that we make inductions on the basis of the surface or the deeper similarity of uh, objects that we're being asked to make predictions about. So stated more formally, the similarity uh, assumption is that arguments are strong to the extent that the categories and the premises are similar. 
So suppose I give you two series of premise and conclusions. A series of premises and conclusions we're going to call an argument. So which of these two arguments is the stronger, better, or is robins have sesamoid bones, therefore sparrows have sesamoid bones. So that's argument number one. Robins have a type of bone, sesamoid bones, and sparrows have a sesamoid bones. So is that a good argument or a bad argument? Is that a strong induction or a not so strong induction? Most of us would agree it's a pretty good induction. Look at the second one. Ostriches have sesamoid bones, therefore sparrows have sesamoid bones. Is that argument equally strong or is it, or is it stronger? Or is it less strong? Most people uh, make the assumption that the first argument is a stronger argument. We're more likely to predict or infer some features of sparrows based on the fact that robins have something uh, than we are to infer properties about sparrows based on the fact that ostriches have it. And the reason seems to be that robins and sparrows are similar to each other. On the top there, you see a robin on the right and a sparrow, I think, possibly as a sparrow. I don't know for sure because a lot of birds kind of look the same, but uh, it's definitely a robin on the right. I'm pretty sure it's some kind of sparrow on the left. But you get the idea they're kind of similar to each other, right? They're small backyard common birds. Uh, ostriches, also birds we know are very atypical. Uh, they're sort of at the extreme. They're the largest bird around. Uh, they don't fly. Uh, they run really fast. Uh, they have an unusual shaped neck. Uh, there are things about ostriches which are different from a lot of other birds. And so if, you f if you're told that there's some kind of bone that they have, so something you can't see, uh, you're a little less confident that sparrows would also have it. Maybe there's just something unique about the bones uh, in ostriches. You find out something about robin bones. Yeah, robins have a lot of similarity to a lot of other birds. They're kind of a prototype. Uh, and since they share a lot of features with other birds, it's probably likely that they share this one too. So that's the assumption. If these objects are similar, then you're more likely to draw a conclusion. So that's why people make the choice that they do. So that's similarity-based induction. Let's look at another example. And this has more to do with typicality, or as we're going to call it, uh, coverage. Uh, so typicality-based uh, arguments or coverage-based arguments have to do with whether or not a that a specific category member covers a lot of the category. So this has to do more with, a, with an overall generalization. So rather than making a conclusion about sparrows, we're going to make conclusions about all birds. So which argument is stronger? Robins have sesamoid bones, therefore all birds have sesamoid bones. That's argument number one. Or penguins have sesamoid bones, therefore all birds have sesamoid bones. Most people would agree that the first argument is stronger, and the reason is that robins are typical. Uh, they cover more of the category. There are lots of other birds that have things in common with robins, and so something that's true about robins is more likely to be true about lots of other birds. Whereas something that's true about penguins, which don't cover as much of the category like ostriches, they're kind of an atypical bird, uh, they don't cover as much of the category, and so therefore, you're less likely to draw the inference. That doesn't mean you can't do it, and it doesn't mean it isn't going to be true. It just means that the first argument seems to be stronger to people. Uh, and this tells us something about the nature of categorical induction. This idea that similarity and coverage underlie a lot of our categorical inductions is prevalent enough that it's the name of a very specific model uh, or theory of categorical induction. So this is a theory that was put forth by... Uh, psychologist Daniel Osherson and many of his colleagues. Uh, so their suggestion is that for the most part, induction is guided by the similarity of the premise category to the conclusion category. That's the similarity half of this. So that was the case where robins and sparrows are similar, and they're more similar than robins and ostriches. And so we can show that similarity is important because that seems to predict that one of them will be a better argument than the other. They also suggest that inductions are guided by the degree of coverage that the premise exemplar has over the category that includes all of the statements. So when you're talking about all birds, Robin covers more of the bird category than Penguin does. And so we can show how this works by suggesting that when people are asked to make conclusions about all birds, they are more likely to do it when they're asked uh, to make it from Robin than when asked to make it from Penguin. 
This idea also leads to some other uh, cases. So I want to show a few more cases here, and then we'll talk about a little bit more about causality and coherence. One of the effects that's predicted directly from the similarity coverage model is a diversity effect. Uh, the diversity effect uh, suggests that, or states that the less similar two premises are to each other, the stronger the argument will be. Uh, now, this sounds like it runs counter to uh, the similarity principle, uh, and it does, but it does for a very specific reason, and it shows the relationship of concepts uh, to each other. So here's how it works. Uh, think about which argument is stronger. In other words, which one of these two statements, or the series of statements, makes a, is a, a more believable or uh, reasonable conclusion. The first one is you're told that hippos and hamsters love onions. So the gigantic hippopotamus on one side, tiny little hamster on the other, they both love onions for whatever reason. Uh, and then you're asked to conclude that all mammals love onions on the basis of this. So hippos love it, hamsters love it, uh, all, all mammals love it. That's one argument. The other argument is hippos and rhinos, so the hippopotamus and the rhinoceros, uh, they both love onions. Therefore, all mammals love onions. Uh, so one of these arguments, well, both of these arguments should strike you as ridiculous uh, because they are kind of ridiculous. But uh, setting aside the ridiculousness of the arguments, most people agree that the first argument is a little bit better. Uh, in other words, if you can imagine or if you're told that the gigantic, enormous hippopotamus, uh, the second largest uh, land animal, I think, out there, uh, is a lover of onions, and that the tiny little hamster also love onions, there's a lot of diversity there. And between hippos and hamsters, you've covered a lot of the mammal category. You've covered the really big things and the really small things, and that sort of gives you a lot of range. And if if it's true across this big range, uh, then it's more it's reasonable that maybe all mammals love onions. But if you're told that the hippopotamus, the large uh, land, second largest land mammal uh, in the world, and the rhinoceros, which I don't know, maybe it's the third largest, but they're kind of similar, right? They sort of live in similar areas. You probably see them in the zoo or on safaris or that kind of thing. The hippo and the rhino, not the same animal, but they're similar enough. They don't cover as much of the category. Uh, maybe there's something about that kind of animal that loves onions that shouldn't be something that is true of all mammals. So hippos and hamsters are very different from each other, but because they cover a lot of the same all mammal category, we're more likely to draw the inference. It makes it stronger because of the coverage. So this similarity coverage model makes this prediction. Uh, it predicts things about similarity-based induction, typicality-based induction, uh, and things like this diversity effect. But it doesn't predict everything. Uh, it seems to place a heavy emphasis on category membership, uh, but sometimes people use the direct uh, similarity between objects uh, rather than the fact that objects are in the same category. Let me show you what I mean. And this gives rise to something known as the inclusion fallacy. So in the inclusion fallacy, uh, people seem to use similarity uh, more so than category membership. Uh, so we know things are going to be in the same category, but sometimes you know, the, the similarity overrides that. So here are two arguments. All robins have sesamoid bones. Probably seen this before. Uh, and all birds have sesamoid bones. So robins have it. Birds have it. Makes sense. It's something that we think is typical, right? Robins are typical birds. They cover a lot of the category. Therefore, all birds have it. Most people think that's a stronger argument uh, than the following. All robins have sesamoid bones. Therefore, all ostriches have sesamoid bones. So first of all, why do they think this? Well, most people think this because robins are typical. They're typical of all birds. We conclude that all birds have the same thing that robins do. It's a fallacy, though, because the second can't be less good than the first. Uh, in other words, if all birds have sesamoid bones, that includes ostriches as well. Uh, so there's no way for all birds to be more realistic or more reasonable or a better argument than all ostriches. So all birds includes all ostriches, so it can't be uh, stronger. It has to be the same or lower. Uh, an individual case uh, is going to be stronger than the overall case. Uh, so this suggests that people aren't always just using category membership. 
they're using the similarity because ostriches are asimilar or atypical. They don't look like robins. Uh, people are less likely to draw that uh, conclusion. So similarity is does seem to be sometimes overrides category membership. There are other things too uh, that don't really fit into this theory perfectly, and that has to do with causality. So let's look at the possibility of causality undermining some of these effects. And that's going to be on the next two slides. So one example is that there are causal links uh, that may exist between different exemplars that would undermine some of these things like a similarity effect or a uh, diversity effect or uh, inclusion effects. So look at these two examples. The first, example number one, cats possess parasite X, whatever the parasite is. Let's just say that cats are known to have this parasite and field mice are known to have this parasite and therefore all mammals have this parasite. That's one uh, statement. So that's an argument. Cats have it, field mice have it, therefore all mammals have it. Uh, second example, cats have parasite X, tigers have parasite X, therefore all mammals have parasite X. Now you should think uh, that the first example uh, is a little bit more diverse, right? Uh, cats and field mice aren't in the same, uh, they're not the same species. Uh, there's, they cover a little bit more of the category than cats and tigers, because cats are, tigers are cats, right? So example two should have less diversity. But most people find uh, the one with less diversity to be more realistic. So people generally, in research, have shown that the second argument is preferable. The first one is strong, but the problem with the first one is that there's probably a causal link. Most people understand that there could be a reason that cats have the parasite, and that is because they catch the parasite from hunting field mice. Uh, we're not told this. Uh, this is an, an additional inference that we make. Uh, so the understanding here is that there's something else that's causing cats and field mice to have this parasite. It has, doesn't have anything to do with the fact that they're mammals. It has something to do with the predator-prey relationship that they have. If that's the case, if people are drawing that inference, then all mammals doesn't make any sense in this case. This is a cat and mouse problem, right? This is not an all mammals problem. Uh, and so even though cats and tigers are not very diverse, it suggests that you know cats and tigers are you know, possess this parasite, it's a little bit more likely that all mammals will have it. So, or as I've written here, knowledge, in this case, knowledge about the relationship of cats to mice and cats to tigers and so on, undermines what could be a diversity effect. We can see this in a second example, a study by uh, Doug Medine and colleagues, uh, and they carried out the first one as well, uh, suggests that even if you switch the order of the premise and the conclusion, you can highlight or not highlight the causal link. So in the first case, gazelles, which are, if you don't know what gazelles are, they're just those, uh, they kind of look a little bit like deer. They live uh, in the savanna in Africa. Uh, and uh, so we're told that gaze gazelles contain a chemical called retinum. And then we're told that lions also contain retinum. So gazelles have it and lions have it. Uh, and most people view that as being a slightly better argument than the second one, which is lions contain the chemical and therefore gazelles contain the chemical. The reason that most people prefer the first one, there's no other information to go on. So same uh, exemplars, gazelles and lions, uh, same predicate, retinum. Uh, there isn't anything about the category structure that suggests one should be stronger than the other. They should be equally strong. People seem to prefer the first one because it highlights the causal path. In other words, perhaps gazelles have this substance, retinum. Lions who prey on gazelles uh, consume the gazelles and then get it from eating, the, eating them. So by putting gazelles first, it suggests this causal path. Gazelles have it, lions have it because they eat the gazelles. It's a better argument than lions have it and therefore gazelles have it that tends to de-emphasize the causal path. And so what Medine is suggesting with this example and the previous example is that there's more than just similarity going on. Sometimes we know about the relationship of one animal to another animal or one thing to another thing, and that these causal relationships uh, can also play a role. So I have one final example to show uh, in this uh, slideshow, uh, and that has to do with the idea of category coherence. 
So category coherence uh, is an idea uh, in the study of concepts and categories that suggests that some categories have high coherence. In other words, there's a high family resemblance structure for some categories. Things just look a lot alike. Uh, we saw some examples in the first uh, lecture in this series when I suggested that uh, uh, when we're talking about Linda, the bank teller feminist, uh, we suggested that feminist supporter might be a coherent category and bank teller might be a little bit less coherent. There's a certain type of person we might assume uh, stereotypically to be associated with someone who strongly supports feminist causes, uh, and we might not have the same understanding of bank teller. Maybe it's a little bit less clear what type of person would be a bank teller. It's a less coherent category. Uh, and one of the suggestions is that we tend to make our inductions on the basis of coherent categories. And this makes sense. If you think about the structure of a category, if things are closely connected, when you find out that someone or something is a member of a category, you're more likely to assume that it has the features that are common of that category. If it's not so closely packed, if it's not coherent, you're a little bit less likely. Uh, so I'm going to talk about some research that suggests uh, that's exactly what we do. So inductions are made from concepts and categories on the basis of similarity, but the coherence of the concept itself plays a role. For example, police officer. I've used this example in other uh, classes and other lectures. Police officer, for most of us, is a coherent category. Uh, I mean, police officers wear uniforms, so they look similar. Uh, they drive uh, police cars, so they're you know, they're driving the same way. Uh, we expect there to be a high degree of similarity among people who join the police force, and we might expect them to share features or traits or behaviors. So if you hear that someone is a police officer, you might feel confident about our predictions about how they might act and behave. We've already talked about that, and we suggested that this might be based on your experience. It's going to be a coherent experience, right? It's a coherent category in our culture, uh, Police officers dress the same, they have the same role, uh, and we sort of maybe think that even the same types of people might be drawn to that. It's a coherent category. Someone who works in a restaurant, a server, uh, might be less coherent. Uh, that doesn't mean there's anything, uh, you know, it's not a lesser uh, job. Uh, they're both uh, jobs that have features that we might be able to predict something about, a police officer and restaurant waiter. Uh, but perhaps maybe compared to police officer, there's more diversity in this category. So maybe there's more reasons why people would have the job. Uh, for a lot of people, restaurant waiter uh, is a second job or it's a part-time job. Uh, there are different kinds of restaurants. There are formal restaurants and there are informal restaurants. Uh, there are different types of uh, restaurant serving. So maybe it's less coherent than police officer. So some research uh, by Andrea Padalano, Seth Chin Parker, and Brian Ross looked at the role of coherence. And they came up with a bunch of social and occupational categories that uh, they pre-screened and had people rate on coherence. So coherent categories would be things like soldier, minister, feminist supporter. These are things that people agreed probably overlapped a lot and that there was something coherent about the category. In other words, a lot of family resemblance structure, a lot of shared features, uh, a lot of causal relationships, lots of things pack these categories tightly together. Whereas categories like matchbook collector, which evidently is a thing, uh, county clerk and limousine driver were low in coherence. Uh, so there are lots of reasons why you might collect matchbooks, and there isn't anything coherent or predictive about it. County clerks... Lots of people can fill that role, uh, so maybe there's something less coherent about it. Lots of different kinds of people can drive limousines. Uh, so maybe we just have less, uh, there's less family resemblance, fewer uh, shared features. So they carried out an induction task in which people were asked to make predictions about people who were members of more than one category. And we want to see which category they base their predictions on. Here's an example. 80% of feminist supporters prefer Coca-Cola to Pepsi. 80% uh, of waiters prefer Pepsi to Coca-Cola. Chris is both a feminist supporter and a waiter. Which beverage does Chris prefer? In other words, Chris uh, is a member of both of these categories, a high coherence category and a low coherence category. Uh, and we want to know which one of these two uh, is he likely to prefer. In other words, which category uh, does Chris, although he belongs to both of them, uh, so 
which category are you going to draw features from? Which one are you going to infer features from? So people in their experiment preferred to make inductions about the more coherent category. So they suggested, and what they found, was that Chris is likely to prefer Coca-Cola because people, people would view feminist supporter as the more coherent category. This is what we've seen in other research as well. So all things being equal, if you're a member of several different categories, and most of us are, uh, people are likely to make inductions about the most coherent of those categories. Okay, I think that's enough for this lecture. Um, you should uh, have a chance to look back through all of these. Think about the questions that I posed at the beginning on the website. Uh, then think about how you might answer some of the questions in the discussion.